talk, as you're going to see, is a lot about uh, strategy, and um, it's going to give you some, perhaps, some new outlook. So, let's get started. Uh, my name's Brad Westfall, and I work at uh, my own company, AZ Pixels, and I work in Phoenix, Arizona. And these three entities below are entities that I uh, hold dear to my heart. Uh, the boot camp that I work for, where I teach uh, front end web design called Rocket IT, or rather Rock IT or Rocket. And um, Phoenix JavaScript is a user organization that I started in, in Arizona. We're one of the biggest uh, user organizations for technology in Arizona. And uh, Cahoots is about the most amazing um, co-working space that I've ever been to, and, and it's right in downtown Phoenix. So if you ever get a chance to visit, you should. OK, so um, yeah, the legal part, kind of, right? <laughs> All right. OK, so um, your goals, I think, in writing CSS should be these three things. And let me know if you have different goals. But I think we're all trying to you know, write stuff a little bit easier, make it a little easier on ourselves. We're trying to get more done in a quicker amount of time. And uh, obviously, performance uh, should always be kind of a fourth thought, right, instead of an afterthought. So um, so far, so far, Stewie and Brian are happy. And, and we're all happy because we all agree on these things. By the way, this is going to be one of those talks that um, you're not going to agree with me on everything, and that's, that's okay because CSS is, is a very um, argumentative type of conversation, especially once we start getting into all of these topics. And um, if you are getting into CSS and you do some searches, how should I do it? You know, what is this pre-processing stuff? You know, what is, you know, how does Twitter bootstrap hurt or help? Um, you know, you see all these kinds of words, and, um, and it seems like a big mess. So that's what we're going to be trying to do in this talk is making uh, making it a little bit clear what all this means. So whenever I have conversations with some of my um, web designer peers, I love talking about CSS and CSS strategy and methodologies. And I always break down every conversation into one of these four categories. I wouldn't say these are really official terms, except for maybe the, the last one, methodology. Um, I, would say that, I would say that every conversation you have about CSS though, it turns into one of these four types of topics. So let's see. Um, you know, when I start talking about methodologies of CSS a lot, I hear from you know, a lot of my JavaScript developer friends. And I'm also a JavaScript developer. But some of my JavaScript developer friends hate CSS. And, and uh, I know that some of you might not like it as much. And usually, it's the people who say things like, oh, I just hack on it until it looks right. Who cares about methodologies and best practices and all that kind of stuff? It's usually those folks that have the most problems with CSS, and I, I think it's interesting. So, you know, maybe if, if we all kind of take CSS a little bit more seriously, uh, we wouldn't have so many problems with it. And um, if you remember, you know, people used to say some of the same things about JavaScript over 10 years ago. Uh, it's a toy language. Um, you know, why do we need any you know serious frameworks or uh, libraries in JavaScript? So, um, eventually, it was taken more seriously, and, and so is you know CSS is getting there. I think. Okay, so patterns. Um, patterns, uh, for the purposes of this talk, is what I'm calling a visual pattern. So we're going to take a look at, uh, this is the footer of Dribble. And if I were asked to design this, uh, I see a few patterns that stand out, visual patterns. Like just think about where the, the boxes are, right? The actual like div tags or um, you know, whatever, span tags, paragraph tags, wherever you want. Um, the first thing, since I usually design from the outside in, the first thing I see is like these two horizontal um, probably div tags or, or something like that. And so I'm thinking that there's something along those lines. But then how do we get that, that edge on the, uh, the outsides? You know, it's kind of like a margin, or we're not really going to use margin, but we need something there to make this thing like 960 pixels wide or something like that. So um, there's probably another nested uh, container right there. Pretty common um, for the lack of uh, terms uh, that are out there. I'm going to call this the double container pattern uh, for right now. Just to, we're just kind of warming up to my my concept of what a pattern is. So um, taking this design again, um, I look at this and I also see another pattern, and it kind of looks like this. And um, this right here is a very popular pattern on the internet. Uh, we see it all over the place. Here's some examples of, of where I've seen it. Um, Anyone want to take a guess as to why I uh, took a screenshot of Nicole Sullivan's tweet? Anyone? Yeah? You know? Yeah? Yeah, so um, 
these are all following this pattern, and the reason why I wanted to make sure that she got a little cameo in this is because this is what she calls the media object pattern in object-oriented CSS. She's got an article from 2010 where she describes that the whole web is made out of this pattern, basically, and it's, it's pretty much true. So those are visual patterns, okay? So these are the things that graphic designers, or maybe you are the graphic designers, are conveying to us that we need to build, and it's our job to build them. But remember those four speech bubbles? The patterns, that's about as far as graphic design goes into CSS. Some you know, more engineer-minded, maybe server-side you know, minded people say that CSS is basically the same thing as graphic design, and it is so not. It is, uh, it is something that should be taken you know, very seriously, just like engineering, and I would say that only the patterns is the only part that kind of overlaps with graphic design. So um, I would also say that this uh, pattern, you know, here's another example of it being used, uh, that same exact pattern, you just change the proportions a little bit, and all of a sudden we have a, a left column you know, type of layout. Um, even though these are becoming less popular, uh, it's still you know, a pattern that we can use. Um, so once we know what our patterns are, we need to implement them, we need to make them come to life. So implementation is essentially where we pull off these design patterns. And so let's talk again about this, um, this media object, and let's talk about the different ways that this might be done. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, say that something should be pulled off with floating. That's a way to do it. That is, a, that is an implementation that you can do. But you know, there's lots of different implementations that you can do. For instance, um, you can do, uh, instead you can do an absolute positioning implementation, which means you have a whole new set of problems with the container. It can't be contained. You can't use a clear fix. You got to use like a, like a fixed height. Maybe that works, except what if your content is variable and changes, okay? So maybe that works, maybe it doesn't. Uh, there's also flex box. There's also a display table. There's also inline block. These are all different implementations. So when you hear uh, or maybe read on the web, you know, people talking about how to create something like this. Uh, they're usually debating over different implementations and what works and what doesn't work. Um, I even read a, an interesting uh, article once where the guy said, if you're, if you're still doing or teaching floats in today's day and age, you are brainwashing people. And um, that couldn't be further from the truth. He was basically preaching on inline block. Inline block is great. I love it. I use it a lot. But there's some things that it doesn't do that floats do. And sometimes floats are just the most stable way to do it um, cross-browser. You know, you could do some of these more exotic things like display table and, and flexbox if you want to, but don't expect it to work everywhere, right? So these are implementations. So, so far we have implementations and we have uh, patterns. Obviously the implementations uh, are a little bit more subjective and depend on the circumstances that you're in. So I don't fixate myself onto one implementation. I use all of those implementations depending on the circumstances and, and you should know all of them and know their pros and cons, okay? But we're kind of leading up to some other stuff. This talk is not about patterns and implementation, we're just leading up to why we have methodologies. So, uh, so bear with me for just a little bit here. Um, okay, so one last point is that implementation lives right here. It lives in between the curlies, okay? And you might be asking, well, well what doesn't live right there in CSS? Um, when we get into ideologies in a second here and methodologies, that basically all lives up in the selector and how you do your class names. So um, implementation is the actual like property value aspect of this whole puzzle. Okay, so uh, for those of you who are more experienced, let me ask you this. If you were to take uh, that media object pattern and if you were to take two experienced CSS developers and ask them to both implement it using the float type of uh, strategy, would they do it the same way? I would argue that they would come up with completely different solutions. Even though they're both doing accomplish, accomplishing the same pattern using float and a certain clear fix or whatever, um, they would accomplish this a completely different way from each other. I would argue that five CSS developers would do it five completely different ways because there are so many different mixes of ideologies. So um, let's talk about why ideologies uh, come into play. And you can see here that you know Stewie has like two, you know, forms. Uh, there's kind of the semantics crowd and the uh, utility classes crowd, and so we're going to talk about what that means. So a lead up to ideologies. Um, in case you're not familiar with these terms, uh, wet stands for write everything twice. Dry stands for don't repeat yourself. These are terms that we use in CSS a lot, especially in the last two years. I've seen them popped up a lot. But uh, if you come from database design, uh, you would call uh, what we call dry, you would call normalization, okay? Um, so 
you know, these, this dry versus wet concept can be, um, it can be applied to more areas in the computer sciences than just CSS, but it tends to be used a lot lately in CSS. So the idea here is that we want stuff to be dry because we're not repeating ourselves, which means if we need to make changes, we have to make them in less places. There's less chance that we're going to forget to make it in one of the places if it's dry. And also, uh, we can reduce bloat, okay? And usually bloat uh, decreasing means that our, our bandwidth and download sizes decrease. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, Twitter. This is the, the brand new design that just rolled out a few weeks ago. Take a look at the the white boxes, the one that's, there's three of them, the big ones that are like tweets, and then there's who to follow, and then there's the trends, and if I reduce this, it kind of looks like this. Now I want you to imagine that you were designing this in CSS, like this is your, this is your task, and uh, you know, this isn't so much a matter of implementation, what properties you're gonna use, that's pretty straightforward. It's gonna be, you know, things like background color and border radius and, and you know, border of one pixel solid, whatever, how you, however you wanna do this. Um, that's pretty straightforward, but if we have these, these uh, div tags, let's say they are, and one of them is tweets, and one of them is follow, and one of them is trends, how do we do this? So um, this is an example of what I mean by wet. Uh, this is write everything twice. In the black on the left, you see um, the background color and the border radius and the, um, the border of, of one pixel um, being repeated three times. And if there were 15 more boxes and you went to this strategy, it would be very wet. You would be repeating it all kinds of times. Imagine how big your CSS file could get over time with this type of strategy and imagine, uh, imagine your boss comes along and says, I want the border radius to be two pixels now or 10 pixels. Uh, you know, the, the amount of times you would have to change and search for that and imagine you'd be very easy to forget. Um, so anyways, uh, moving forward, we have dry CSS. This is kind of like moving forward with someone's, you know, basic CSS career. They abstract something into a class, um, in this case box. Notice that the three div tags still retain their original classes because we need to, might need to individually stylize those at some point, but this is, this is an abstraction technique. So this is a version of doing dry CSS, not one that everyone agrees with, but I think everyone agrees that we need dry CSS, like that's a goal, but uh, this is one implementation of doing dry CSS, okay? So um, this is where ideologies start to kick in. Ideologies uh, typically describe your willingness um, to separate concerns. I mean, we all hear those things. I've heard that 10 times today by other speakers, separation of concerns, whether it's JavaScript from CSS or now CSS from HTML or this, that, and the other thing. Um, people either have a stronger, uh, a, a stronger willingness to really truly separate them and uh, those people like to um, make class names that reflect the meaning of their content. You're gonna see what that means here in a second and not the aesthetics and structure. And a weak separation is the people that say, who cares, uh, class names can reflect aesthetics and structure. It makes my life easier. Anyone have an idea of what you are right now? Because I would argue that you're one of these ideologies whether you know it or not. Does someone not know what you are? Who doesn't know what they are and uses Twitter bootstrap? <laughs> okay, another question. Who uses Twitter Bootstrap? Do you guys know that you're number two? Okay. All right, that's fine. Not making any judgments <laughs> yet, but let's move on. Okay. So, um, class names should reflect the meaning and the content. We sometimes call this crowd of people the semantic crowd and class names should reflect the aesthetics and structure. Um, there's not really a name for this crowd except for they're like the non-semantic crowd maybe, but we'll call, they use what I call utility classes and some other people call these utility classes. We'll get to that in a few minutes, but for this purposes of this talk, we'll call this the utility class crowd, the Twitter bootstrap folks versus the semantic crowd. And by the way, um, semantics, um, CSS semantics, just to go on a little bit of a, of a tangent, I don't wanna go too far on the instruction, but does anyone, does anyone know where I'm going with this before I even say anything? Like, um, there's really no such thing as CSS semantics, okay? Um, if you haven't heard that yet, you're hearing it now. And um, you can read lots of articles about it. Um, there is such a thing as HTML semantics, you know, going from div tags to like footer tags and the side tags, that's, that's all good. That's for devices and stuff. But um, devices don't read your class names and they don't care. The class names are just there for us to hook into. Truth be told, um, big blue heading, is that semantic? 
actually, I would argue that it is perfectly semantic because it is, it is perfectly describing exactly what it is. It is a big blue heading. Semantics is the study of meaning. Okay, if we were talking about HTML here and I said, is a, is a footer tag semantic? You would say yes, because it's describing a footer. This is describing a big blue heading. Now, I wouldn't say that it's good uh, naming conventions because if we want to change big blue heading to big orange heading at some point in time and maybe make it a smaller text, then it's not a good strategy. So for some reason, this crowd is called the semantics crowd when they would say, this is bad, this is not semantic. But then there's lots of people, really good articles out there by really good CSS experts who would say, actually, um, this, uh, this is really is semantics, but that crowd still needs a name, and so we're just gonna call them the semantics crowd, even though I think it's kind of a farce. Is that okay? If, and, you know, um, someone I showed this presentation to before I came out here, he goes, you know you have a shoe thrown at you in this presentation, right? So if you don't agree, that's, that's fine, but, um, you know, Twitter out to me and I'll, I'll show you some articles where some pretty cool people have uh, argued otherwise. So, you know, one might say if we did want to change this uh, big blue heading to be, um, you know, an orange color and make a smaller text, you know, that's like the classic um, argument, you know, for semantics. If you want, if, we're going to call these semantics for now, right? Um, so the classic argument is, well, you should never name this big blue heading. Maybe you should have named it uh, primary header or something like that, primary heading, something that can change and, and keep its meaning. So you're describing the meaning of the content. Remember, that's what the semantic crowd is, describing the meaning, not the aesthetics or the structure. So this is clearly describing the, uh, the aesthetics. Um, and you might say, okay, semantics crowd, but that never happens. I mean, come on, who like makes their class names big blue heading and then changes it to an orange heading over time. Like, who really does that? Is that a real, like, use case? Uh, Nicole Sullivan is someone I would consider to be, like, top two or top three CSS experts in the whole world. And she's the author of a paradigm called uh, Object-Oriented CSS. And so I kind of clipped out this little video of hers. And I'm actually hoping that this uh, audio picks it up. So I'm going to turn up my speakers really loud. Give me, like, the big thumbs down or thumbs up if it's not loud enough. So I, I, they didn't have, like, a thing for me to hook up my computer for audio. So. Let's see what she says about, oops, not that direction. Okay, whoa. Here we go. If it even loads, right, with the internet. Sort of like the Amazon of France. And um, I... No? I was working with them, and I was super happy with my CSS. I had these Can you hear awesome... It? Very clear selectors, very clear what they did. They were like, you know, big blue heading, and tiny purple heading, and that kind of thing. I was like, this is great. Why are we messing with this, you know, you know, semantic stuff? That's nonsense, right? Um, and then six months later, I had another project with them, and I went back and I saw the same developers and taped up on each of their cube walls was this awesome thing that said. Big blue heading actually gives you tiny orange heading. <laughs> and they had this graph for what you would get out of it. And I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> what did I do, right? Um, so very good. Yeah, so um, very brave of her to kind of call herself out from her younger years. We were all there. I mean, we all did silly things like that. So uh, very cool that she shares that with us. So it does happen. So, um, you know, I'm just kind of, just kind of, Describing the semantics crowd a little bit. No, nope, too far. Okay, so um, a worst nightmare for a CSS semantic purist is uh, utility classes, or what they might call classitis. Um, you've probably heard of divitis. So classitis is like a term where someone kind of overuses classes uh, for the wrong reasons. Uh, by the way, semantic people are not against using class names. Sometimes that's like at the end of a presentation, they're like, "So you guys don't like class names, or what's the deal?" No, we we like class names, um, but you know, they can be misused. So um, so what am I describing here with this first div tag, right? I'm basically describing what half of you raised your hands on, right? Twitter bootstrap, that's just like their, their way. Um, so I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a CSS uh, semantics purist, but I do, I do kind of subscribe to some of their ideas. And um, I'm just letting you know, this is like their worst nightmares doing this sort of stuff. And we're gonna talk about why, or like grid systems. Again, how, I mean, you, you really, you gotta understand, you really can't say that you agree with like, the semantics paradigm, and you also use Twitter Bootstrap or grid systems because they just don't mix. I mean, if you're using a grid system, you're basically describing your structure through class name, and that's 
you know, that's a way to do it, that's fine, except just understand that you are falling into one of these two camps. Okay, so um, blast from the past. Let's go back to that uh, example where we had the tweets before. So, okay, so fine, CSS semantics guy, wise guy, w what do you wanna do about this situation if we're not gonna, you know, have wet CSS, you know, but not, you know, use utility classes to solve a situation? Well. Uh, one idea, perhaps, I'm not saying it's, it's like my favorite idea, but one idea is, you know, you could just do, do this. I mean, you could still have very, um, very dry CSS. Notice how clean our HTML is now without all the class names. Um, it's a solution. It's not like it's the uh, ideal solution. Truth is, it's really hard being a semantic CSS person in real life because it's, it's like the uh, utopia of, of CSS and, and HTML's relationship. It's really hard to accomplish. So this gets us a little closer, but can you imagine how hard this would get with like tons and tons of things and, and commons eliminating everything and it, it gets hard. So I understand why people resolve to like using lots of utility classes, but let's, let's move forward into methodology. So, um, all right, so methodologies here are an attempt to create standards for writing CSS in a modular way. Okay, we wanna do that, but without employing utility classes or classitis, right? Um, so let's, let's see exactly um, you know, what we mean. Um, one famous one is object-oriented CSS, right? We talked about that. This is pretty much one of the only methodologies I'm gonna get into. There's also one called BEM. There's a few others I've looked into, but I always kind of forget their names just because I don't use them. Um, feel free to like shout out you know, your favorite one. But object-oriented CSS is my favorite because it makes the most sense to me, but also because it is just so easy to follow. And so a methodology, by the way, is not like something like, like SAS where you're downloading a tool or like you know jQuery, you gotta like download a tool and then you get to use that tool or like Polymer, you know, you bring it in and then you get to use it. A methodology is something that you just get to start subscribing to by just behaving differently. So you get to use object-oriented CSS right now as long as you have this tool in your head, these two rules. Um, I might talk a little bit about rule number two towards the end, but really I wanna talk about rule number one, separation of um, structure-based classes from design-based classes. That's, that's one of her rules. And you, know, you don't have to like write this down or anything. You could read up an object-oriented CSS and she has a whole blog and it talks about this in more detail. Another one is um, don't use context-based selectors. What that means is like, if you have like a class name like, like um, comment, then don't, use descendant selectors where you're like header, or rather maybe it's like article, uh, div, comments, and then it's like comments, you know, don't use descendant selectors like that. And so she has good reasons for that too. Um, again, I can talk about that at the end if we have some time. Uh, all right, so by the way, I'm the kind of presenter where you're gonna have to probably tell me like how much time is left because I'll just keep going as long as there's questions or it looks like you're interested and not yawning, so. All right. Um, so let's talk about this whole rule number one, separating the structure classes from the design classes. Now, I'm not gonna write any actual CSS up here for you, like on the right-hand side, because if I were to write actual CSS, that means I would be doing um, the implementation, right? The stuff that goes in between the curlies. And that's not what I'm gonna do. Um, instead, let's just talk about like these two class names fundamentally. We have, we have our media object here. Notice in this case, it's, um, it's a white background. It's got like a black border. Um, the data line right there on the, the BD uh, div, by the way, I, I use BD just because I, I literally copied and pasted most of this right from her website to be kind of true to what she was trying to describe when she was describing object-oriented CSS. So um, BD in her case, she says uh, stands for body, like the body of this, this little guy right here. So I just did the dotted outline just so you can see where it goes. Um, okay, so notice that we have the media class and the comment class. Now, this is not an example of using utility classes because if there were utility classes, you would see like rounded corners and pull left and that sort of thing, the kind of stuff you see from Twitter Bootstrap. Instead, what you're seeing is the media class does things like the dimensions, the width and the height, and the choice of implementation. So in this case, maybe it's the float strategy or maybe it's the you know, display inline block strategy or whatever, but the point is it's just doing the structure. And then the class name of comment is doing the aesthetics, okay? So it's doing the background color of white and the border radius in this case, okay? So you bring in those two uh, class names and what this allows you to do is you can use this media object. Remember how she shows that the media object, for instance, is something that you can use for all kinds of different stuff? Well, what if we wanted to have comments 
at the bottom of some page, but we also want to have uh, products on like the same page or something, right? Um, you could have this be a product. You could have the image be the product picture. You can have the content of the product on the right-hand side. You would only need to then make a class called product, like this, and the media class still creates all the structure for you. So this is what she meant by object-oriented CSS. There's really no such thing as object orientation in CSS. Um, I think she picked object-oriented CSS because uh, it's, it's catchy, it sells books and that sort of thing. Um, it obviously picked up and we all know about it, but um, maybe a, a really good description would have been um, pattern-oriented CSS or modular-oriented CSS. So the idea here is we now have that media class. It hasn't changed. It still sets up the dimensions and the choice of implementation, okay? And then we have the product class, and, um, and that sets up a new design. It has a different background color. Notice that it still implements the border radius. Okay, so is this, you know, a wet strategy or a dry strategy? I'm asking you guys, what do you, what do you think? Because really we're going to have to have border radius mentioned twice, one for dot product and one for the previous slide, which is dot comment. I mean, I, I think it's, it's still pretty dry. I mean, you're okay to, you know, say something more than once in CSS and still have it be dry. It, it turns into a wet concept when you have like an entire chunk of CSS that creates like a design and then that gets repeated like over and over and over again under the context of different CSS selectors. So I would say this is dry. And then notice that we can bring in uh, not only uh, we bring in one structure, but we bring in two things that do design. So product is like standalone. That would just give us the blue background and the border radius, but we can also bring in featured. And we can use things like uh, the before and after pseudo elements to create like uh, some sort of like little circle thing that kind of hovers over the whole thing like you guys have seen on like new uh, products. So um, I actually have a little code pin for you guys here and, and um, I don't know if I'm going to wait long enough for you guys to write this down, but you can always look at my slides later on and play with this if you want to. So what I have here, uh-oh, what's going on? Redirect, okay. What I have here is just a, um, a little example of what I'm talking about. Okay, so if I can make this a little bit bigger, can I? All right, there we go. Okay, so look over here on the left. We have our HTML, and we have two of these... Um, media objects, okay, see they both have class media, and then um, I guess this is gonna make us scroll down to see that. All right, so, uh, so they each have that. If we go up here and look at the, uh, the way that I did that right here. Okay, so we have media, we have a width of 500 pixels, padding of 10 pixels, okay, so we can kinda see the gap right there. Display inline block, margin left, okay. So then the media describes what the image looks like and what the, uh, the body looks like. Okay, so that's all it does. Notice that there's no aesthetics in there, it's just simply structure. And then coming down, we have comment, and comment has background colors, border radiuses. Um, it can still like describe the image, in this case makes it a different color blue, and uh, does something slightly different with the, uh, the body. So um, that's basically what you're looking at here with, the, um, with this guy right here. Okay, so then scrolling down, uh, we have dot product, and notice that uh, over here, this guy's got media, and this guy's got comment, but the next one has media, product, and featured. You know, all I have to do is take out, you know, a design-oriented, um, a design-oriented uh, class name like that, and we can change the design. So, I mean, it's kind of like utility classes in a way, except for notice that these, notice that these classes uh, let me ask you uh, this question. Media, product, featured, do those describe aesthetics and structure or do they describe the actual content that's there? Right, which one? The content, right? Okay, so we don't have to resort to using class names that describe the structure and the content. And this is all important because, uh, well, because of the next few steps. I mean, let's, let's move on to the presentation again. So, okay, make this full screen. Okay. Okay, so, um, so when they say dry is better, let's talk about why dry is better. I mean, like really, let's, let's talk about, I mean, why? Let's, let's question everything, right? Um, is it because we don't wanna write everything twice? That's, that's one reason they say dry is better. If someone says, oh, this code's not dry enough, we, we don't have to write it twice uh, because, you know, 
if you have to make a change, you got to change it twice or this and that. Um, or is it because we don't want to have everything twice? Because I would argue that, that there's a very distinct difference. Maybe not if you're authoring actual CSS files. Like if you write a CSS file and you're writing um, you know, your selectors and your, your implementations, then yes, what you're writing is what you're having. But that's not the way CSS is done anymore. And it's unfortunate if you do have to write regular CSS. Sometimes I do, and it's a little bit of a pain. Um, or both, OK. Um, so why can't we write dry SAS and have wet CSS? OK, or dry CSS. Why can't we have one and the other at the same time? I mean, ultimately, I would argue that um, I would argue that the reason why we don't like wet CSS is because when you have to make a bunch of changes, you have to make those changes in lots and lots and lots of places. And um, with SAS or less, I'm more of a SAS person, but uh, with SAS, you don't have to do that. You'd write it once, you have uh, mix-ins, you have extends, uh, you have all these things for you, and it produces dripping wet CSS. Like, like everything is like repeated over and over again, especially if you use mix-ins, okay? But what you authored is very dry. So, you know, the only counter argument to this argument that I can think of is, well, your CSS that you're producing is extra big and it's going to take a long time to, to download. You know, I'd say get rid of that little tiny dumb graphic that you have that's that big and take that size, you know, the size of that graphic is essentially the size of how much CSS you just accumulated. Yes? There you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I mean, you could use it both. So I guess they would argue that, that they, can, they can make theirs faster, and so we can make ours faster, but that theirs is still a little bit faster because it's, it's extremely dry. I would say, you know, if you really cared about, you know, a few more characters that the CSS is going to produce from SAS, um, I don't know. I, I would say, what's the alternative? Writing things in Bootstrap where you have lots of utility classes, and then, you know, let's just remember that the whole, um, the whole point of doing a utility class, like let's say you do like brand color as a class name and you make it like orange or something like that, then you can tell your boss, hey, check it out, I got this like class name, brand color, like sprinkled all over my HTML. So if you ever want to change the color um, from blue to orange, we can just make that one change in our CSS file, you know, with the class name and brand color, and it changes everywhere. Because we have it in our paragraph tags, we have it in our anchor tags, we have it in our header tag, we have it in all these tags everywhere. Okay, good argument. What are you going to do when, uh, when I don't want the brand color to be in all those tags? I just want it to be in some of those. Then you got to go and rip it out of half of your tags. And so I think it's a big myth of using utility classes to save you time. Um, I think that ultimately we can't predict the future. and We can't predict what the boss is going to say about our sites and what they want to do. So I don't know, I, I'd rather pick a, a method that keeps the HTML really clean but allows me to write really dry and so that method means we're going to be, I, I'm going to be writing SAS so it stays dry. And I'm okay with the actual CSS gets a little bit wet. So let's talk about that same um, dilemma we had before where we're, we need to accomplish these white background uh, borders and, and border radiuses. Uh, notice that the created CSS is on the right, so it's a little wet. Okay. The, um, the SAS on the left uses, uh, uses mix-ins to do this. So if you're unfamiliar with SAS, I'll just describe what's going on real quick. SAS and LESS are preprocessors, which means we get to write the thing on the left. It's like a made up language. Like some guy thought, I just don't like CSS today. I'm just going to make up my own syntax. Okay. You can do the same thing if you wanted to. And just like with him, no browsers are going to support your syntax or his syntax ever. They're only going to support regular old CSS. So what he did was he wrote this special syntax that he liked. And he wrote a processor for it so that he runs it through this program and it turns the thing you see on the left into the thing you see on the right. And then the thing you see on the right is the thing you actually ship up to uh, the browser for it to be processed. So, um, so what's going on here with the mixin is a mixin is essentially kind of like the CSS equivalent of like a function, if you're familiar with some programming. So uh, down with the red uh, tweets and follow and trends on the left hand side, we get to say include box. And then that's like saying include box is kind of like calling that function and it brings those chunks of CSS down. And you know, a person could argue, well, 
that's nice, but I'll stick to my utility classes because this still makes really wet CSS as an output. Okay, fine. Use extends instead. I got claps. You can clap louder if you want. I don't mind. Okay, so um, this is kind of like a mix-in. Um, extends gives you the ability to e extend previous uh, written CSS, and notice what it produces on the right. Remember that stuff when I was talking about this semantics and how it's hard to be a semantics person because we don't want to write that way, it's too difficult? Great, then write it in SAS the easy way and have it produce the ugly stuff. Not to mention, if this were a real output of, uh, of CSS, I would have it minified. Okay, so that would also take out some characters. Who cares? I'm never going to look at that CSS file and open it up and try to dissect it. I'm going to use uh, Chrome's developer tools to like inspect an element and see what it is. And then people say, ah, oh, SAS, but what, you know, the stuff you're writing in the line number that it's on doesn't equal like the real CSS and how, you know, if it's all minified, it's all going to be on line one and, and how do you deal with that? I don't know, I wrote all the CSS so it's easy for me to remember like where, I don't know, it's just easy. Like I'm, if I'm inspecting the media object and it says the CSS came from line 412 and I know that it really didn't come from 412 because it came from somewhere in SAS, I go to my CSS spot where I wrote the media objects. I mean, it, that's, that's where I go. And if you're really that concerned about it, there are like newer technologies where you can actually like educate Chrome on how to map your SAS file to your CSS file so it'll actually tell you where the SAS is. So that's another talk, but you know, I just don't, I just don't, I don't, I don't see why you guys aren't writing CSS the same way I write it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, so anyways, uh, you have these uh, extends. Does anyone know the problem with extends? Because when I talked to this with some other people earlier, they said, well, why don't you just do everything in extends? Why, why are mix-ins good for anything at all? You can't pass variables. You can't pass variables into it, for starters. Um, up here, if we wanted to, I didn't write it this way, but with that box up at the very top, top left, I could have put parentheses right there and made arguments, and then down below with the tweets and the following trends, I could have passed in values, and so potentially we could have had uh, each of these uh, div tags have different border radiuses, for instance, because I could pass different things in. That's one of the, of the perceived uh, values, or I, I say more than perceived, that's one of the, the values of using, um, uh, using mix-ins. What, what is the other one? Anyone know? Anyone know? Yes? Well, that's not so much of a problem, except for um, if you're familiar with, um, with nesting in SAS, where you can, you can nest. Um, if you use extends and you nest extensively, uh, I've heard that there's some severe problems with that, and it can create some really, really bizarre output. Okay, so uh, that's, that's one of the other problems. However, um, let's go, you know, how much time do I have? Because I'm like three, three or four slides away. 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Oh, perfect. Okay, so let's... Let's go over here, and uh, I wasn't planning on doing any, any stuff here for you, but why not, right? Okay, so if we were gonna write some, um, if we were gonna write some SAS, like header, and then, um, hold on, let me just, oh, that's fine, because I'm really quick. So you could do like header, and then you could do like nav, and then you can do like, you know, UL, and then, Li, I feel like I do this pattern like all the time. Isn't this the way that headers are always done? Okay, so um, you could do something like this in SAS, and then you could put your properties, you know, right here that correspond to the Li, and the stuff that corresponds to like nav, like would go like right there. And then what this produces is uh, header, nav, ul, Li, and would do that stuff right there. That's another feature that SAS has. That's really cool. Um, anyone see a problem with this? You know what, I'll just tell you what the problem is since we don't have a lot of time. Um, you should not over-select. If this is the only instance of LIs that exists in header, your CSS should look like that, first of all. First, it's a performance increase because the browser doesn't have to do as much work to find the stuff. Um, it's not overly specific, so if you wanted to change it later on, there's this thing called specificity, right, where at line 16, we've given a certain amount of specificity to this uh, Actually, yeah, this is hard. okay. Um, and if you wanted to change something about this allies like later, you would be able to do that because the specificity isn't too high. Um, and then lastly, remember that thing I talked about with object-oriented CSS and that second rule? Um, the reason why Nicole Sullivan says don't put your, your media, here's all the stuff for the media, right? Don't put that in deeply inside of, of header, nav, ul, li, the reason why she says not to do that 
is because now that media class can only live in one place. It can only live inside of header, nav, ul, li. She would like to see you do this, and so would I. Just go like that. It's a lot better for performance. It's a lot less specific. And so doing nesting like this in, in, um, in SAS is nice. It's a nice feature, but sometimes it can be vastly misused. If you watch any presentation on misusing SAS, they will talk about overnesting. Okay? So that's, uh, that being said, uh, let's move on to the next slide. Thanks for the time update. Okay, so what's next? I don't even know what's next, really. Um, okay, so I want you to imagine that you can use a preprocessor like SAS, and you can use object-oriented CSS at the same time, because object-oriented CSS is a methodology for how we should write class names and how we should modularize our class names. And SAS, like Less, is a preprocessor for building our CSS, so they, they're totally complementary. They're not uh, opposing each other. Um, they can be used with each other. So I want you to imagine that maybe this is like the future of object-oriented CSS, where I don't exactly have a class name called media and then a class name called comment, or, or instead of co comments, having a class name called product, and then if it's product, then maybe I'll have a class name called feature. Maybe, maybe this is a way to do it where the media um, class brings in by way of uh, mix-ins the media information and the product information, the featured information. This would produce really uh, wet or yeah, really wet CSS output. But you know, this is just an idea. I just want to you know put some ideas in your head. So, um, so anyway, um, last slide. Um, we know that this is wrong, right? I mean, this reminds me of like when I was doing front page in, in uh, 1998, right? We know that this is wrong, right? So can someone please explain to me why this is any better? Like what is the freaking difference here, really? I mean, it's a little bit better, a little bit, but I really don't see why. So it's not that I, I hate Twitter Bootstrap, it's, it's good, nice for prototyping and stuff, and there are others like it, Foundation and whatnot. Um, but all these libraries that just give you a slew of class names and then you kind of sprinkle them all over your HTML like, like candy and, and produce some design. Um, you know, you can, you can get yourself into some, some troubles with that. So anyways, um, like I said, I can go on forever about this topic. It's my favorite topic to talk about in computer sciences, but I'm pretty much done. Let's, uh, let's all either go home or do the after party, okay? Thank you very much.